I am a stand-up comedian. Um, how I got there is probably what this presentation is going to show. I will start with um, horrible memories, because that's usually how you become a stand-up comedian. Um, I would say my worst memory that I can think of uh, probably happened to me in the third grade. Uh, not the third grade, the sixth grade. Uh, we had this program in my school where um, the sixth graders would read to the third graders. And probably about three minutes into me reading to this third grader, I struggled so much that she took the book out of my hand <laughs> and she read to me. And there is not a person in my family that doesn't know this story and not, has not made fun of me for it. And uh, I think that resonates with me so much because that has been something that has happened to me continually. I'm supposed to be in a place where I'm supposed to know what I'm supposed to be doing. And very quickly, people find out that I don't. So my second worst memory happened to me when I was probably about 23 or 24. I had been doing stand-up for a while, and I was in this weird place where I was making money as a stand-up, but I didn't make enough money to quit my day job. So I knew that I needed the flexibility of some kind of part-time job so I could start doing more road work, but I needed to make money. So I decided to become like a nanny or a babysitter. And I found, which actually kind of became a luxury job for me, I found this rich couple on Craigslist, believe it or not. Uh, and when I say rich, um, it's, this is all in Manhattan, they shared a building with Ron Howard and Alec Baldwin, like that kind of rich. And I was a, like a part-time babysitter, four hours a day, five days a week, for this little seven-year-old uh, that went to an all-French speaking school. His first language was French, he was fluent in English, he could speak Spanish, and he was learning Mandarin. I still don't know how to read most English. Um, <laughs> And my, really, my responsibility was taking this kid from one program to the next. Take him to tennis, make sure he doesn't get hit by a bus. I just may, needed to keep this kid alive and go to these appointments to psychologists or whatever. And um, I, had, I, I couldn't do any, all his homework was in French. I had no responsibility. I swear to you, I just ate their chocolate. They had great chocolate. <laughs> and I watched somebody else teach this kid. But occasionally, he only had English twice a week, and occasionally the mom would ask me to look over his English homework. So I was doing this for months. I would look over, I would look over his second grade homework. I'd be like, looks good to me. <laughs> and a couple months into this job, the mom sits me down and she's furious with me. And she goes, why haven't you been checking his English homework? And I go, I have. And she goes, I really don't appreciate being lied to. And I literally bursted in tears and I go, I thought it was right. And I find myself in that place often where I send emails. Sorry, I'm getting emotional. That's so sad. I, uh, I send these emails. I tell these people what I'm supposed to be doing and they come back to me like I've lied to them, like I've told them something differently. And those are probably my worst memories. So let's go back to when me discovering that I was dyslexic. I was in the third grade, and uh, everybody had individual reading time, and I didn't know what they were doing. Uh, I would pick the same book every time we had individual reading time. I had a cat on it, and it seemed like it could have been a really great book. And I would sit down, and I would count the words in the book. That's what, I didn't know what anybody else was doing, so they discovered that I couldn't read. They sat my parents down, they told them I was dyslexic, and uh, I'm the second oldest of five kids, so they already started to experience this, this with my sister, so they started putting me in special classes. And I think most of you understand what spe special classes are. You get pulled from all the regular classes, and uh, it's not exactly individual attention. There's probably five to 10 other kids in these special classes, and not everybody has what's going on what you have. So there was a couple other dyslexics, but you have some kids that are autistic. You have some kids that have different learning dis disabilities. You have kids that have behavioral issues. Uh, you have kids that just can't sit still. You have all these different kids in one room, and my problem wasn't that I didn't want to learn. My problem is I didn't know how to. And uh, my mom, who's one of the funniest people I know, as we got older and all her kids turned out to be dyslexics, uh, she started to call it physics for felons and chemistry for criminals. <laughs> because we were all very diligent students trying to learn and then there was always some kid burning books in this corner. And nobody understood how this was a better alternative to education. 
So that was one one of the things I had to do. I, I lost, you know, you don't see your friends ever again, and everybody is just, you're just with a bunch of people that also don't know how to read, and that's not very helpful. What they did do for me is they put me in special classes after school. So twice a week, um, I was taken to a local college um, called Ryder College in New Jersey, and college students would sit down with me individually, and they would help me read, they would help me with my homework. And what they did that's probably completely influenced my life is they would have me write, which nobody really sees that other side of it. They see that you can't read or you can't do math, and they focus on that, but nobody actually focuses on the fact that you, almost like, um, what's that disease? Um, I think Richard Pryor actually had it, where you can think clearly, but you're, you, can't, you don't have the motor skills. It, that almost feels very similar. So it's like, I know exactly what I want to do and see and ha come out, but I don't have the skills to do it. And I started having a filter for that. So I started writing books. I started writing these little books, um, the series called Spiffy the Spider. I'm pretty sure it was a spider because it was the only thing I knew how to draw. And uh, it was all about Spiffy the Spider and all these issues uh, Spiffy had with his hundreds, brother hundreds of brothers and sisters, which I have four, so I felt like it was the same. And... Uh, I kept writing these stories about Spiffy the Spider. And all of a sudden, I started to realize, A, I love attention. This individual attention is amazing. Um, <laughs> I'm not getting that at home, and I'm not getting that at school. And B, I'm starting to see that there's something I do enjoy doing, and there's something that I am good at, because I have all these ideas, and they're starting to slowly come out. So that was actually kind of the special course that started to help me. I was told that good grades were important and that was going to be the thing that propelled me in life. So I did. I got A's. I got B pluses. I worked really hard to show people that I knew what I was doing. But I didn't. I'd found a way to understand what they wanted and then I would fill in the blanks and I would give it to them. And that was my entire education. I didn't learn how to be the information. I learned how to survive school. And that carried on until college. So I didn't want to go to college. I had started doing stand-up when I was 16 years old, and I was going to be uh, Chris Rock, and I didn't need college. Uh, my dad sat me down and told me I did. And so uh, we had a very nice negotiation. He told me I could only do stand-up on the weekends, and I proceeded to tell him that I only did stand-up on the weekends. And I did it every single night, and I would bring my homework to every single comedy club, and I looked crazy. I, I look like I'm 16 now. Imagine what I looked like before in a comedy club doing my homework. Um, <laughs> I got kicked out of so many comedy clubs. <laughs> but that's what I did, I, I survived college. And I actually went to, I went to the new school in New York City and why I applied for that school and um, it was actually my first choice and I got in is because I didn't have to take math and I didn't have to take science and they didn't test. I, um, I probably took maybe a, one or two tests in the four years that I went to the new school. It was all essays. And that might sound a little crazy for somebody that's not good at writing and, and reading and stuff, but I am a great persuasive writer. And I, you know, a lot of grammatical mistakes, a lot of issues, but if you're just looking at ideas, I have them. And I could write these amazing 20-page persuasive essays and creative pieces. And I started to understand my brain more and more as I started to do things on my own because I've never liked classes. I won't even take like a class in a gym. I don't want to jazzercise with you. I will get a personal trainer. I'll have somebody show me once or twice and I'll figure it out on my own. Um, and that's always how I've been. So I self-taught myself how to do stand-up. I discovered it when I was probably... I don't know, like 13 years old. I always thought I wanted to be like a funny, I wanted to be like Sandra Bullock in the 90s. And I thought that was what I wanted to be. But then I realized writing was such a huge part of my life, I just didn't know how to um, put it out there because I was scared to. So when I discovered stand-up, it was like the perfect combination. I could write, but nobody actually ever saw my writing. And it became this perfect way to express myself. So when I was... Um, 14 years old, I watched every stand-up comedy special you can think of, HBO, Comedy Central, anything you can think of, I watched all of them, and then I would VHS them, and then I would watch them again. And I would show them to my friends, and I would show them, and I would watch them again, and then I would quote it to my friends, and then I would write those jokes in my notebook, and then I would show my friends in the notebook, and then I would write them in another notebook, and then I would tape them on another show, especially since Comedy Central repeats everything, I probably have the same comedian on four or five VHS tapes. I just got rid of those two years ago. I decided to stop moving all my VHS tapes that I don't even have the ability to watch anymore. But that's what I did. I became obsessed, and I started studying it, and I started... Um, 
writing my own jokes when I was about 14 years old. And I would, I had a couple of friends that I felt close to and I would take these packets of writing I had and I would give it to them in the hallways. And I would ask them to star what was funny. There was a couple of douchey friends that actually spell checked it and I would try to ignore that. But I, uh, they would give me feedback and from there I started to collect a set and I started doing stand up at 16 years old. And from all these experiences, I started to understand a little bit how my brains worked. And this is a, a, an analogy I kind of came up for dyslexia for me. I always envision somebody that's not dyslexic and somebody that is dyslexic and they're in a gym and they're in an apartment and they live right across the street from a gym and they want to go work out and get into shape. Somebody that's not dyslexic just walks across the street and goes to the gym every day. They get fit in like three to six months and everybody's like, wow, you really applied yourself. I'm so proud of you. I, on the other hand, for some reason, can't just walk across the street. I have to go around the building every single time. So by the time I get to the gym, I'm tired, I'm frustrated, and I don't understand why everybody else just gets to walk across the street. And so I don't work as hard. And for some reason, half the time, the elliptical's broken or too many people are on it. It's just a frustrating experience that just exhausts me. But after you pursue it and you keep pursuing it and you keep pushing yourself to go to the gym, you start to find little pieces that you can break apart and do differently. So maybe I'll go through a window this time. Or maybe I'll go over the building and I'll go through the stairs. Or maybe I'll just work out in my apartment. And you start to find alternatives. And that's the best way I can describe dyslexia for me, which is at first it's hard, but then you just start finding different solutions and you start catering things to your own mind. Um, sorry, I have ideas. <laughs> I would say how I really discovered how exactly uh, my brain works is through social media books. Um, this has been a very long career for me, and if you know anything about show business or stand-up comedy, uh, they usually tell you it takes about 10 years to find your voice and about 10 to 15 years for people to consider you an overnight success. Um, I'm at 13, I'm trying to maintain my look so people think I'm still 16. I. Um, I, around maybe five years ago, I lost my manager, I didn't have an agent, and getting an agent's really hard, and I had to find the solution of how do I tell people about what I do so that I can get more work. And I started looking at social media as a solution. Um, the problem is, is that I never paid attention to it before, and I didn't really have anybody in my life to explain the importance of social media and what to do with it. So I did what I always did, which is I just started reading books. So I went to the section about social media. I started reading all the books about how to use Twitter, how to use Facebook fan pages, how to use Instagram, all these different things, and how to use it. And the reason that social media books taught me how I learn is because social media books aren't written for teenagers. They're not written for young people, because young people just know how to use Twitter. They've had it since they were seven. Social media books are written for like 60 year olds that don't know how to say tweet. <laughs> and they're written very simply and they're incredibly visual. And they're, they're not a very, most of them are like this thick and they're not dense at all. And I started to realize that this is how I need to be taught to. This is how, I need a lot of examples. I need it to be spaced out. I need it to be repetitive and I need it to be incredibly visual. And all of a sudden I started to realize how to teach myself. So I need to be taught like a third grader, but with more dense information. I wanted to um, break down some of the things that um, I hate, which I think you guys can relate to, and then kind of bring it back and show you some of the things that I, I actually do like and that I'm good at. Um, I hate spelling, um, uh, pronouncing new words or uh, places. I will never ask for directions. I probably should be a dude. I will never ask for directions. Um, <laughs> Reading out loud, I forget which girl did the presentation about reading out loud. If I'm allowed to curse at you, I would. Uh, that's so mean. <laughs> I, would never, I would never make anybody read out loud. Uh, texting somebody important or cute, I don't do that. Um, uh, having to read, I hate having to read an email 10 times. I think it's exactly where it wants to be. I send it, then like 20 minutes later, I'm like, did I do it right? And I look back and everything's wrong. That happens every day. Um, people reading over my shoulder, that's the meanest I've ever been to somebody is I, I take the subway every day and if I see somebody reading over my shoulder, I start to write like crazy notes in the lines so they know that I know and they get scared. I would like to scare people, that's what I'm trying to do. Uh, people spell checking me, I don't need that. If you knew what I was saying, get off my back. Uh, I actually, uh, I do want to teach a class at the new school. If I ever like get a teaching degree, I would teach creative spelling because I... <laughs> Because I, because I think it should be rewarded. I know how to, sp I know how to spell museum ten different ways. 
You only know one, you're not even trying. Um, being called dumb is probably my least favorite thing. Uh, math, I will never do it ever again. Uh, I don't like anybody that got a perfect score on their SATs and I will not talk to them. And I don't like ferrets, that has nothing to do with anything. Uh, I will tell you what I am good at and these are the things I learned through stand-up comedy, through reading, um, just through life. I, uh, I'm a great divergent thinker. I come up with unique ideas, especially when people have run out of, run out of ideas. Um, I'm really good at talking out my ideas. So sometimes, you know, you'll have these environments, it's a round table, everybody's coming up with ideas. I can't just think and push them out, I have to talk them out. So I have a lot of, um, I have a good friend that lives in LA and we'll just be telling each other about our day and just from talking to each other, we'll both come up with 10 jokes just because I have to, I have to say it out loud. Um, making unique connections. Um, I definitely do that. Uh, the big picture thing is, is pretty much how I make a living, is I can take something big and connect it to smaller things. Um, resourcing and tapping into past experiences and information. I spent most of my life thinking that it was a waste of time to read some of these books because I wasn't remembering anything. But then, and, you know, and this is, comes with age, now that I'm 30, there's books I've read 15 years ago that all it takes is one experience and like a filing cabinet, I find that thing in a book and I now know how to apply that information to that experience. And that only came with constantly reading and constantly having experiences and it becomes this resource that I can't always unlock it, but when I do unlock it, it becomes like a floodgate. I'm really good at analogies <laughs> um, and cursing apparently. Um, uh, I'm really good at explaining stuff and breaking things down into bite-sized pieces since that's how I learn. Um, I'm really good at writing, persuasive and creative, um, talking too much, clearly. Um, I'm a good reader, I read excessively, but it's slow, but it's deep. I, I tend to retain a lot of what I read. Um, except for this presentation, I'm usually really organized. <laughs> um, and I have, a, I have unique organizational techniques because I have a bad memory, I have to get things done, and I, um, I don't recommend everybody does what I do organi organizationally, but I can help other people by seeing their patterns. Um, I'm constantly improving my, da my daily activities, and I can walk on my hands. Just again, bragging. <laughs> and I will, um, I'll, I'm going along, so I'll end with this. I, um, I'm gonna tell you one of my more recent jokes, and I'll kind of break it down and show you how um, some of my dyslexia has made me come, with, come up with those ideas. So uh, this is a, a joke that I wrote pretty recently. I, uh, I ended up spending $4,000 in a day last week and my credit card company called me up like, are you having a meltdown? <laughs> Which I thought was nice, because if I was having a meltdown, I would have to tell people. I would have to call up my friends and be like, hey guys, things aren't going well and I'm thinking about cashing in all my chips. And my credit card company called me up like, hey, those aren't your chips. Isn't that nice? People like to villainize credit card companies, but they called me, they emailed me, and they texted me, when's the last time a friend did all three? <laughs> they called me up like, hey, Miss Mealy, we see you spent $500 on gummy vitamins. We want to know if you have a new lease on life or you just don't know how suicide works. <laughs> I'm gonna walk you through that process so we can get our money back. <laughs> And so the way I break down that joke is I kind of use uh, the criminal activity alert that your credit cards give you on text messages and phones and stuff like that, which this all happened. And uh, I compare it to something that's actually something I think about a lot, which is how uh, friendships have changed over the years and how this uh, ability to be connected constantly is actually kind of disconnecting us. And so now if I tell a friend I have a bad day and she leaves me a message and she calls me and she texts me and she shows up at my house, I'm just like, you and credit card companies, wow, you guys really care. It's become like a new barometer of people caring about me. So I made something that seems completely disconnected and I've connected them to show what good friendship looks like. Um, so that's like that big picture thing that we kind of talked about. Um, uh, uh, do, 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 do. Uh, I shine light on uh, like emotional spending. I mean, I think that's something that's incredibly relate relatable for other people, and I kind of break it down to show how it looks for other people. So I think being dyslexic is uh, often you explaining how your brain works to people. So I would say 90% of my jokes, even if you don't agree with what I'm saying or understand my experience, it's me taking a snapshot and breaking it down so you can follow how I got there. So why would I spend money on that? Well, these are some of the silly ideas that I think you might get there for how I might spend money in that, in that way. Um, 
do, 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 do. I think that's about it. And I just, I, I break things down into digestible pieces. And um, I would say uh, kind of a parting idea is that I think um, dyslexia and stand-up comedy in general is all about a unique uh, um, perception and a, a kind of a new, I think we've all kind of learned that you process things differently. And in stand-up comedy, no topic has not been touched. So everybody has their joke about why men and women are different or why black people and white people are different or you know why your parents call too much after retirement. Whatever the topic is, everybody has a joke about it. So you have to find the unique angle on it because everything's been talked about. Why do people like cats more than dogs or vice versa? What's my unique perspective? And when you're constantly looking for the better side of things or things to be easier or things to be different or just to get things done, you're constantly seeing the unique side. So I've spent most of my career being told that my jokes are really smart, which I didn't believe until probably a couple of years ago. I thought I was tricking everybody. And only recently have I realized that because my brain works differently, my jokes are actually more unique than most people because that's just how my brain works. Thank you so much, I'm Liz Mealy.